So welcome to Logic and Proof. Uh, this is actually the last year I'll be giving it, so I'm very glad I managed to get the damn thing going. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Um, I think it's a COVID requirement, guys, to keep us all safe. I'm freezing too. Um, uh, uh, that, I mean, I think if it's an issue, we need to take it up with the department, but I think we, we've got to do that. Anyway, so why are we teaching logic in the computer science department? It's a very good question. Um, so maybe before I launch on my slide, we are dealing with technology that usually doesn't work, and we are trying to make it more reliable and work better, and the only, well, one way we know about doing it is to specify things formally. Indeed, some people have been happy just to specify things. So there was a whole industry starting in the 1980s merely writing out specifications formally of what software was supposed to do with the idea that the mere act of writing down exactly what you wanted would help you think better. And I think it helped a little bit. But of course, more than that, we want to be able to actually <clears throat> use theorem-proving technology of one sort or another to prove that our systems are correct. And there's now you know, a lot of work in industry. All the famous tech companies you've heard of are using this. Um, Oddly enough, a lot of misguided people also thought that logic was the solution to AI. So maybe now I can start on my slides because, you see, logic has been thought, I think, for thousands of years, since Aristotle perhaps, to have something to do with the way human beings reason. Um, I think we know now that this is somewhat misguided, so we've had like 50 years of psychological research, which seems to show pretty conclusively that we're not as different from the animals as we think we are, that we're actually not that good at logic, so a Sudoku is a trivial logic problem and they are very difficult for us that most of our behavior comes from the animal part of our brain and the kind of higher intellect is often used to make excuses for the thing that the animal part of our brain made us do. So if, if any of you, for example, find that you are temporarily unable to sweat, for example, that is an example of this phenomenon. Um, anyway, but in this course, we'll be looking a little bit about logic in general, but of course, this is a computer science course, and we'll be looking at theorem-proving technology of various kinds um, and its application, well, its intended application either to prove computer systems correct, although not in this course, or to verify uh, mathematics. Um, I do need to say this little bit about the idea that we're modeling human reasoning. So in the 70s, at least, some of the great names in AI, I think John McCarthy in particular, and I think others, really thought that if you had a powerful automatic way of proving theorems, intelligence would follow automatically because we go about our business by proving theorems. But as I've already said, we don't actually do that. And that line of AI research really was a dead end. And it's kind of interesting that all the AI of that era was purely symbolic. And now very little, very little of it still is. Oh, God. I'm freezing too, people. Okay. At least no one can fall asleep in these conditions. So... In, did I even use up this slide? I, sh I, I didn't even. So we'll be talking about statements, and in this particular lecture only, we'll be being strictly informal, just as a gentle introduction. But of course, for the rest of the course, everything will be symbolic. And we are mostly interested in the true statements. Of course, other statements are false. 
we have statements that are not determined by, shall we say, the contextual information available to us, um, and others that are completely meaningless. Much of the time we'll be interested in relations between statements rather than the statements themselves. So not merely P is true, but P implies Q, or P and Q cannot both be true, and so on. Now, a bias statement, again, being strictly informal, so we'll use English. And so, for example, black is the color of my true love's hair is a definitive statement. And actually, OK, it comes from a folk song, but it also brings up a lot of the issues involved in logic already in English. So first, we have terms like black, which means something. Um, but that's fairly straightforward. Again, color, we can imagine, is fairly straightforward. Um, my true love is has several problems, like who is my? Um, the meaning of true love is slightly tricky, and especially my true love is different from your true love, and so on. There's also the question of hair. Um, so for example, if your true love is bald, we've got a problem here. Um, OK, which is very funny, although. In mathematics, you might be talking about x divided by y, and well, maybe y is 0. So you see, there, there are real issues. And whenever you, you talk about logic, we have things of what are things referring to, and what happens if the thing that you're referring to does not actually exist. Now, just not so important, but just to remind you, we're not talking about questions although sometimes theorem-proving technology can answer questions like that. The prologue is good at that. Uh, wishes and commands are not logical statements. Now, of course, we are going, we want to have some variables because otherwise you're dealing with a lot of fixed statements and it gets pretty boring. So. We can replace my true love by some variable x, which is far less romantic. But it gives you some flexibility. Um, we can abstract even over hair now. And here we're abstracting over the color black. And we're having kind of anything can go there. And now we have reduced the entire thing to simply a relation between one thing and another. So obviously, the ability to have variables is crucial if we want to have any flexibility in our language. But once we have variables, we start needing the kinds of annoying mathematical stuff that keeps coming up in this course. So you all had discrete maths. You all adored it. And, <laughs> and you'll have ample opportunities to exercise it in this course. So we will be looking at some simple functions. This so-called interpretation is something that gives, that maps our variables to things. I should say, whenever we use logic, we have something in mind, a specific domain of discourse. We have something we're talking about. And maybe I should mention, the world of formal logic is the world of ideal things, not the world of real things. So in the world out there where there's a bunch of bicycles, some of which are really very dirty, and some have the tires need to be pumped up and so on, that is the world of real things. And you could do a scientific study to find out how many of those bicycles need washing or need to be taken to the bicycle repair shop like yesterday. Um, you could maybe prove that people don't take good care of your bikes. But that kind of proof has got absolutely nothing to do with what we're doing here. You know, real world stuff, proving a thing in the real world, is super important. And that's what science consists of. But it's not at all what we're doing here. We are talking about we're going to be used ultimately a symbolic language 
to talk about mathematical things which, in my personal opinion, mathematical things do not exist at all except in our heads. Now, there are different points of view, so it's a philosophical point of view called Platonism that ideal objects also exist somewhere out there. But wherever they do exist, if they exist, they're nowhere near where we can go and take a look at them like those bicycles over there. So how did I get on this sidetrack? Well, it's a very important sidetrack. So all I said we use logic to talk about things, but these things will always be ideal things that we have idealized. So they might be based on real-world things, but we will idealize them like you did in physics. Ah, you don't do physics anymore. That is so sad. But you've done them in school. You know about the frictionless pulleys and the planes that have no friction and all those wonderful things they have in physics that don't exist. And the reason for that is to use mathematics, you need ideal objects. So anyway, our interpretations are going to be functions that map the variables to entities that we want them to talk about from one moment to the next. So if I have black is the color of Y, I can put in coal for Y. And again, coal is not a real coal, if you like. It's some idealized coal that we're imagining. And that will make it true. Or we put in strawberries, and it will be false. So we will be using interpretations a lot when we talk about the semantics of logical statements. <clears throat> OK. Now, the next concept we'll be talking about is satisfiability. Again, we'll see it. As we look at different formalisms, we'll have to revisit all of these things and fine-tune the definition to that particular formalism. But in general, we have some notion of a set of statements, so declarative statements that are meaningful, and they are satisfiable if they can all be true at the same time. At the same time, I mean, the language here is a bit lousy because I should really say with one common interpretation. No, no, we're not really talking about time. Is there one interpretation that makes all of the statements true simultaneously? Um, so I have examples of unsatisfiable sets of formulas. So in the first one here, the first one says x is a subset of y. The second, y is a subset of z. The third, x is not a subset of z. Well, clearly, the subset relation is transitive. So there's no way all three of those can be true. If, if x subset y and x subset z, then definitely, sorry, if x subset y and y subset z, then definitely x is a subset of z. So there's no way of making all of these true. Maybe that's trivial. So the next one is more interesting because it's an infinite set. So if I have, and it's a positive integer, and at the same time, it isn't 1, it isn't 2, it isn't 3, etc., there's no way they can all be true at the same time. So those are examples of unsatisfiable sets. In both cases, so if you want an example of a satisfiable set, just remove any element from either of those, and they will become satisfiable. <clears throat> Um, the next thing that comes along is logical consequence. That actually arises from the satisfiability. So we, and this is actually a fairly obvious thing. So S entails A kind of means if everything in S is true, A must also be true. Or to put it precisely, for every interpretation, an interpretation that makes everything in S true also makes A true. Um, now, there's a funny thing here, then. If S is unsatisfiable, then S entails everything, kind of trivially, because nothing makes everything in S true, and therefore A is always, that, that we don't even have to ask about A. 
Um, so we write, and now you're probably thinking this looks like implies, doesn't it? But it's not implies. The point is, and this is what trips everybody up, at the moment we are talking about semantics. We're talking about these interpretations. Um, when we get to things like implies, that will be about syntax. So there we will have a lot of symbols and we have rules for trans transforming some symbols into other symbols. And of course, we're computer scientists, so we should understand that syntax and semantics are different, but that syntax should mean something, meaning it should have a semantics. And of course, the kind of formal semantics of the syntax ought to agree with what we think it kind of does or what it really should mean. Anyway, so we have an entailment. Uh, I just said what that means. And I just want to mention that we have these two examples of an entailment, and you should recognize them from the previous slide because the first one says, if x subset y and y subset z, that entails x subset z. And this other one, n not 1, n not 2, and so on, entails n is not a positive integer. So you'll see those are basically the same examples as we had on the previous slide. And that is because S entails A if and only if not A joined with S is an unsatisfiable set. But I'm sorry for all these technical definitions, at least we're talking about English, but they will be the core of most of the technologies we look at in this course. And when I say technologies, these are software packages that you can download and run on any machine. So, you know, we do get to real world things eventually here. Um, what if S is the empty set of formulas? Then we simply have A being entailed by nothing, meaning A is somehow a valid formula. So it's a tautology, if you like. And that is the same as the single set containing just not A, being unsatisfiable. Right. Now I'll try to move into the world of proof. <clears throat> so at the moment, we have these sets of formulas in containing variables, and then we have interpretations so that we can make the formulas true and false, and we're wondering, you know, when does one group of formulas imply other things? Um, a proof is a different thing. So here we write, we, we invent some kind of formal language. And again, we're computer scientists, so we deal with kind of formal languages all the time, things like C. Um, it's not quite formal, but it's, it's kind of formal. C has sort of a semantics. It's actually a terrible <laughs> This is why your machine crashed this morning. But <clears throat> anyway, here we'll be working with proper, strictly formal languages with strictly defined semantics, in which we will be using things called inference rules, which are kind of analogous to the way fragments of programs can be processed. Now, this is a very rough analogy. But inference rules are a purely syntactic procedure that mapping one formula or maybe a couple of formulas into an additional formula. So, and the idea is that these strictly syntactic procedures are going to model reasoning in some way and allow us in particular to detect these valid formulas that we have been just learning about. Now, the interesting thing is that once you define a formal system, it becomes a mathematical object in its own right. Then you can prove things about it. And then you're doing metamathematics. And then if you tell your mates that you're doing metamathematics, they'll say, wow, woo. But they won't say core because their grandparents said core, but they don't say core. Right. Let's have that.
I hope that put everybody in the right mood for the course. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, now, I know you've seen bits of logic already in discrete math, so there's going to be, in fact, the next lecture or two, you'll probably see a bit of repetition, which probably did no harm. I mean, you loved discrete math so much the first time, I know you would enjoy seeing it again in a slightly different guise. So, formal logic, as I said, it's syntactic, so we're going to be writing formal strings and creating proofs by sticking these strings together. Um, the way we do that is with things called inference rules in which we have a bunch of sentences above the line and they allow us to deduce some sentence below the line provided these things satisfy some requirements. So it's always given by their syntactic shape. So if the A1 up to AN exactly match what is expected for this inference rule to be applicable, then we can use the rule and it will deduce for us this other formula B, which will of course be derived from A1 up to AN. A typical way to come up with an inference rule is because you have a bunch of things that entail something else. So if I know that the A's, A1 up to AN, entail B, then it might be reasonable to create such an inference rule. Now, as I say here, the inference rules must be selected carefully, which means you don't just grab every combination of things that turns out to be true and throw them in and make yourself a gigantic calculus because then it would be literally infinite in size. So what you do is think very carefully um, about the minimum combination of things that is needed to capture all the things you want to be able to do. Um, so with no redundancy and preferably you also want your proof system to be easy to use. So this is where metamathematics comes in. So there are two very important properties. I'll mention them later, actually. Firstly, you want your inference system to be sound. That means the theorems that it claims to be valid actually are true. Also, you might like it to be complete. We can't always achieve this, but completeness means if the thing is true, there is a proof of it in your system. Anyway, once you have a bunch of these inference rules, the idea is that you stack them. You just keep doing this over and over again, making more and more theorems until finally you want to get the thing that you were trying to prove in the first place. So here's something that we might use if we had a special logical calculus for set theory. We might have this rule here, which is expressing the transitivity of the subset relation. Now, the interesting thing about a proof is that it is purely syntactic. This is important because we're using computers and computers don't know anything, um, but they can check syntax. So a computer can check our proof for us. Now, the interesting thing about logic is that you can check the proof purely syntactically, purely based on its form, and irrespective of whether you agree with what it proved, even whether the conclusion is true or if the premises are true. In other words, we all know garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you begin by assuming something that's incorrect, of course your conclusion could well be incorrect as well. If your proof system is not sound, then your conclusion might not be correct. Nevertheless, it is a correct proof according to the rules of your proof system. Uh, I think a, a game is an analogous example. So if you invent a game with stupid rules that no one wants to play, nevertheless, there is the concept of correct play according to your game. And I guess the other crucial point is that it doesn't matter who created the proof, 
So even if your worst enemy came up with a proof of something, it doesn't matter whether you like them or not, indeed, or if it is your true love. You just check the proof itself, and you know whether it's correct or not. Now, I'm going to go on about this because I feel a little guilty because I've been lecturing a course of this sort since the 90s, and I was getting it wrong every year until this year. And there's a very important distinction here between these two concepts, which we're going to see over and over again. So you, we, we will sometimes use, refer to the co property of consistency, or its negation, inconsistency, when talking about a formal system. An inconsistent formal system has a proof of every statement. So if you have a thing for proving uh, identities between numbers, if it's inconsistent, it will prove 1 equals 2 and 2 equals 3 and everything. Or in logic in general, an inconsistent logical system will prove every statement. Obviously, that's bad. <laughs> Um, but it's a syntactic property. So you have a formal language, a system of formal syntactic rules, and these rules, it turns out, generate every statement. Um, we have already seen the notion of an unsatisfiable set of formulas, but that is a different thing. That is a set of formulas for which there is no interpretation to make them all true. Now, these are kind of related in the sense that they both somehow imply the impossible, they imply something being badly wrong. But the difference is one is at the level of semantics, the other is at the level of syntax. And we do need to keep these levels apart because remember, the syntactic level is a thing that can be stored in the computer and that we're going to operate on. The semantic level is, if you like, the mathematics. It may look like splitting hairs, but you do have to get your definitions right here. Now, I want to just say a few more things before we finish and find somewhere very warm to sit. Um, so we're using English only in the first lecture. And I'm going to give you some reasons why people use formal logics. So this thing called Richard's paradox, a whole bunch of these paradox were cre invented around the start of the 20th century. With Richard's paradox, we take all the real numbers that can be defined by an English phrase. As it says here, like positive solution of x squared equals 2 is a real number that we have defined uniquely. Now, because these are English phrases, we can imagine sorting this list, and we get a series of real numbers. Maybe it's even an infinite series of real numbers. Um, we can sort this list, and we can do a thing called diagonalization. Ah, have you, you have not had computation theory yet. You will get it, and you will find out what diagonalization is. Um, well, this step here is an example of diagonalization. So we have a series of real numbers, and what we're going to do is create a new number and make it different from every one of the real numbers in this series by changing one of the digits in, e in each decimal place. This will be a new real number. Um, the point is, though, we have defined this real number in English, but we already had a list of all the real numbers that could be defined in English. So you see, we've got a contradiction here. Right, and that is Richard Paradox. Um, or Berry's Paradox. So I changed it slightly. I reworded it to have only nine words. 
The smallest positive integer not definable using nine words. Well, there are nine words here. And so this is the problem, you see, because there are lots and lots of numbers definable using nine words. And one of them is this, but I've just defined it using nine words. Uh, what is the problem here? The problem is, you could say it's a circular definition. Um, because it's English, because our head can kick in and say, hey, wait, that defines it too, where somehow it's cheating, right? Because they didn't mean to define it in nine words in that way, but how do you know? So this is why when you, whenever you do things in English, there's always a thing that you didn't expect. Um, and so you're going to get these contradictions all over the place. And by the way, if any of you have heard of Russell's paradox, you can see that you can even get contradictions when your language is completely formal. If you haven't, well, there is no easy way to avoid contradictions. What do you do? You invent a formal system, you use it, you have fun, and you just hope and pray that nobody finds a contradiction in it. Because one thing we've learned from the mathematics of the 20th century is that we don't have a general way of proving systems to be consistent. In fact, this was Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which means you just have to go ahead and hope for the best. Anyway, I um, can't think of anything that, any widely used formal system that has been proved inconsistent recently, so maybe we'll continue being lucky. I want to say, just to finish, a few things about the formal logics, some of them which will be in this course and others not. So first, our traditional Boolean lo uh, algebra, sorry, Boolean logic, which we'll be looking at on Monday and which you've already had in discrete maths, and which indeed you've already had a bit in hardware courses. So it's the same old thing, uh, incredibly useful, and it turns out um, if you thought it was trivial, yes, mathematically it's trivial, what we can do with it is um, really impressive. And the reason, as we'll see later, we can make solvers for propositional logics that handle maybe millions of variables, certainly hundreds of thousands. And once you have propositional formulas that are that big, you can encode a lot of real-world things in them, um, solve them automatically, and get a lot of logical automation there. So first-order logic is one we have quantifiers for all and exists, ranging over what we call individuals, so not over sets. And there'll be a lot of that in the course as well. Now, of course, as our logic gets stronger, automation gets more difficult. Propositional logic is decidable. You probably know it's NP-complete, which means it's probably exponential, to test whether um, a collection of propositional formulas is satisfiable. For first-order logic now, it becomes undecidable. Nevertheless, we have some very good algorithms. You can download, you can run, and you can do some proofs automatically that you wouldn't have a hope of doing um, with pen and paper. Going on further, so higher-order logic, we now include a type system, and we suddenly can have for all and exists where our variables are ranging over sets and functions. We still have some automation here, but it's a lot more difficult. Um, what else? Modal and temporal logic. We actually have a lecture on modal logics. These turn out to be useful for talking about time behavior, and you can then talk about things like um, concurrent systems, deadlock and livelock, um, mutual exclusion, and typically, although you can prove things in temporal logics, people are much more interested in using things called model checkers, um, which check typically finite but very large 
configurations for your mutual exclusion property or whatever it was you were worried about. And there are various constructive type theories which um, have been very good for securing grant money. And uh, people, oh, whoops, people now are using them to formalize mathematics and um, there's still a lot of interest, there's still being developed a lot of research going into them and what they can do. There is a bit of dogma about them as well, which, however, is not particularly helpful. So all of these things have been used uh, in computer science, and but we're really only going to talk about them two here today. And now what I suggest we do is go away and find somewhere warm. Thank you. Thank you.